I'm going to assume that the majority of the audience are either new or relatively new to MuleSoft technology and their AnyPoint platform. I'm going to assume that the largest groups of people are either Salesforce admins or Salesforce developers. And because of it, I've added a few slides where I'll take a step back and look at the problem MuleSoft was built to solve before I get too technical. This is the legal slide I was told to put in. I have no idea what it means and I've never read it. All typical Salesforce implementations in organization will involve the same process. Step one is to set up Salesforce. This usually involves setting up a sandbox, maybe on a custom instance, implementing the data model, creating the user accounts, and then handing it over with some training. As you're walking out the door, they no doubt will stop you and say, oh, by the way, we also need your help to integrate Salesforce with our existing systems. They could have an e-commerce website such as Shopify that's taking orders, potentially some web forms on a website where customers enter data into, or an in-house built CRM system that they're trying to move off to Salesforce, but chances are it's going to stick around for a while. If you decide to turn around it to stay and help with the integration, you'll first need to determine your options. Salesforce provides two applications that you can use. One is called the Salesforce Import Wizard and the other the Salesforce Data Loader. The Import Wizard is a manual process. It's CSV based, meaning that you click on a button, an import button and select a CSV file on your hard drive. It can only load a max of 50,000 records and you can only map to five of the standard objects in Salesforce. Salesforce Data Loader is a, again a manual process, but this time it's installed on your local machine. Again, it loads CSV files, but this one you can map to all Salesforce objects, and it has a slight mapping feature where your CSV file can have extra fields in it that don't map to Salesforce. However, the biggest hurdle in using both these applications is getting a CSV file with all the organization's data already formatted into the Salesforce object model. If you are familiar with, with it, you'll know that Salesforce has a pretty strict model that you need to follow. Accounts are mandatory. They link to contacts. Orders have order items. Product prices are managed in price lists. The good thing is most systems, including Magento, will allow you to export their data into CSV format. So this icon in the middle that is supposed to represent chaos is the process of transforming the source CSV file into the Salesforce CSV file. This usually involves merging and splitting text, deleting some columns, creating new temporary ones, cleaning some data, and for sure formatting some dates, currencies, and numbers. Great, that's not a big deal. We have Sally or Rick who's an Excel guru. Or if you're not that lucky, you did some formulas in Excel back in school, didn't you? You can give it a shot. The problem is I've seen far too often is that this manual process becomes a normal monthly, daily, or even hourly business task. This is a complete waste of a person's expertise, potential, and basically life. And this is where I want to help. Many studies contend that roughly 50% of a work day is filled with busy work, activities that keep a person busy but have little value in itself. The example I use to describe this is how many times have you had to call into a company to change a setting on your account? This puts your life on hold as well as the person on the other end of the phone. With a good Salesforce implementation, your call center agents will never have to ask customers when they call in, who is this? What did you order? What is your address so I can enter it into my system, even though the customer already entered it when they purchased your product? If we can reduce these low value, unproductive tasks, agents can get through calls faster, waiting times will be reduced, and people can get their life back. This is what I've dedicated my life to helping. In case you're just walking in here without checking the agenda, my name is Jason Estevan and I'm an integration engineer. I've been programming since I was in high school and I have no plans of stopping anytime soon. 
At Intuit, I'm part of the FACT division, which is the FACT, uh, finance and compliance technology. And we orchestrate messages between our massive e-commerce systems and then package these processes into easy to consume APIs to enable other parts of the business. My life's vision is to reduce busy work by 1 billion hours. From the graph on the right, you can see is as of last month, I'm currently just short of 100,000. The two biggest wins that have got me to this number are a suite of Magento payment apps that I've created that helps merchants manage, manage their payments in one location, as well as stop the common process of merchants taking their credit card information off e-commerce orders and walking to the front of the store and entering it manually into their point of sale system. The second win, which is a bigger one, is was at Intuit. We have a product called PTO, which is for professional accountants to file tax returns for their clients. In order for them to do so, each return needs, they need to purchase what is called a bank, or you can think of it as just as a filing. And the old way they would, they would have to purchase these banks is to call into our call center. So what I did is create a few APIs so that now they can make these purchases without having to leave the product with just a few simple clicks. And this has added up to 73,000 hours of saving of busy work savings. And this number is calculated based on Intuit's wait time, which I cannot disclose here, to their call center, as well as the time it takes to fulfill the tasks, and then times by two, because it's not only the accountant you're taking away from their business, but you're taking away the time from the call center agent who could be helping customers with non-mundane tasks. As you can see, I'm still quite far away from my billion hours. My team's two busiest APIs are one that allows customers to update their credit card from our online account system, as well as to cancel their subscription with a button click from inside the product. Even though I've worked on these APIs a lot, I didn't technically create them. They were already built when I when I joined the team, so I can't really take credit for those hours. So I'm on to plan B, which is to help others reduce busy work in their organization. So let me take a step back and define what integration engineering is. If you've ever purchased the desktop version of Intuit's new uh, two main product lines, QuickBooks or TurboTax, You'd have seen on the last step of our checkout page, a big buy now button. Clicking this button calls my team's place order API. Hopefully in less than two seconds, you would have seen an order success page. However, what you don't see is what is happening behind the scenes in that short period of time. If you are purchasing a physical product, we check our inventory systems to make sure that we have it on hand. Depending on where you're purchasing from, we have to calculate your tax for your final order total. We take your payment information and send it to the payment gateway to make sure it's a valid credit card and you have sufficient funds. We have to create a license for you in our licensing product so that you have a right to use the product. Depending if it's a subscription product, we enter it into our billing system so that you're billed monthly or annually. In order for you to log into your product, we need to create a username and account in our identity system. If it's a shippable product, we send it to the warehouse for fulfillment. And then lastly, we send an email to you with your order confirmation details, as well as how to get into the product. And these are just the basic ones. We, in actuality, we pretty much have doubled these amount of systems. As you can probably guess, there's a lot of computer code needed to take your shopping button cart click through this process. We need to push and pull data into different systems. Each systems have different structured models that we need to translate our data into. Different systems require being accessed using different transportation methods, such as FTP, SOAP, REST, SQL. On top of all of this, we need to make sure all our communications are secure to protect data traveling across the internet as well as handle any potential errors gracefully. This is what's called integration engineering. Here are the three most complicated tasks I have to deal with in being an integration engineer and how MuleSoft has made it multitudes easier. 
I'll be using each one of these in our demo coming up. The first one is data transformations. So for me to convert a source XML file into a target XML file, I, before MuleSoft, I would have to create these thousand line XSLT files that had complicated logic written in XML format. But with MuleSoft, what I can do is they have what is called a transform message component, where now I have a visual editor where I literally just drag and drop a field name from source to destination to create my mapping. And this handles multiple data formats. So if up, up with my XSLT transformation, that was only for transforming XML to XML. If I was using a JSON, I would have to use a different method altogether. The second case is transports. So I've written here some typical Java code that you'd need to connect and query a database. As you can see, I have to download and install my driver. I have to create my connection pool, as well as use a bunch of rarely used Java classes to create my statement and then pull out my results. And then I have to worry about my connection management and make sure if even if I have any errors, I don't have any memory leaks. In MuleSoft, they have these pre-built components that will reduce all this code for me. So in this case, this is a database component, which we'll see in our demo. And now all I have to do is specify how to connect to my database, my username, password, and connection string, as, and the query I want to perform. It's that simple. And the last one are connectors. So connectors simplify the logic needed to use some of the most popular APIs out here, out there. So if you've ever connected to the Salesforce API using SOAP or REST, you would have gone through a struggle just like I have. You have to make sure that you have all your request headers correct. You have to make sure that your values are the correct type. And you have to make sure that the URLs you're accessing are accurate. And this request right here is just to authenticate. So you have to make this request first, capture the session ID that's returned, and then use it in every subsequent call to Salesforce afterwards. So this management and logging in is completely taken care, for, care of you in MuleSoft by using the Salesforce config. All I have to do is drag this component into my flow, enter my username, password, and security token, and now I don't have to worry about authenticating at all. I just make my calls to Salesforce, and behind the scenes, the session management and authentication is handled for me. So let's get back to our problem of solving busy work by loading data into Salesforce. There are two types of data processing, batch and real time. Batch is when data is collected, usually over a period of time, and processed by a separate program. It utilizes parallel processing to allow for high throughput, and it's, it's really heavy on the computer resources, so it's usually run off hours, usually overnight, and it fits well in well with less time-sensitive data, such as extracting, transforming, and loading situations. Some of the downfalls are, is that once you start a batch, you can't stop it due to data integrity reasons, and it has very lit limited error handling. Real time is the media processing on continual input. It makes data available in the target systems immediately. It allows you to take actions on errors, and this fits in well with time sensitive data such as banking operations. So at Intuit, we have an API that allows you to update your credit card. And usually what when customers are updating your credit card, it's because they're about to place an order shortly afterwards. So we need to make sure that this API is in real time so that the order coming afterwards uses the newly updated credit card. And it also fits in well for analytics for, for immediate decision making. This is tough to do, but if you can make all your analytics reporting in real time, then you'll have up to the minute dashboards on how your app, how your uh, systems are running. So if you were running, say, a marketing campaign, you can see throughout the day how successful it's doing. And if it's not doing successful, you can tweak it many times throughout the day. The downfall of real-time data processing is that you are susceptible to load peaks. So you need to resource for highest utilization. 
Add into it our busiest time of the year by far is the three days prior to the US tax peak. So we have purchased and set up enough servers to handle thousands of transactions per minute during this time. However, this is a complete overkill and waste of money the remaining 362 days of the year. So let's get into our demos. So I'm in AnyPoint Studio and this is where I code my mule flows. So on the right here, I have in the, my mule palette, I have a list of all the components I can use and then I drag and drop my component onto my mule flow to create a business process. So the way to read this here is that an event is triggered from on the left side and I process that by taking steps from left to right. So in this case here, we're going to design a batch processing flow. And the business case here is that we have an e-commerce store that takes orders and places them into a MySQL database. So the MySQL database has one row per order. So in our mule flow, what we're going to do here is that every 60 minutes, with the first one being as soon as I start off the server, we're going to go into the database, which is the database configuration right here, and pull all orders. In a real system, you'll probably just be pulling new orders, but for this case, we're just going to keep it simple. And then we're going to process that, all those orders, once I cross this line, into my batch job in parallel. If you're familiar with the Salesforce data model, an order consists of creating an account first, and then the order, and then attaching orders in order items. So in order to upload to Salesforce using their APIs, I have here, this is a Salesforce connector. So in order to connect to Salesforce, all I have to do is create this configurations with my username, password, and token, and specify what type of object I want to create. So in this list here, I have a list of every single object in Salesforce, including my custom ones. Very handy feature that MuleSoft does. And then that's it. So here is my connector to create my account object. Here is my connector to create my order. And in my last batch step, my order items. And lastly, what we have to do is convert the data model from our e-commerce database to the Salesforce data model. And that is done using these transform message components. So I was talking about earlier, it's a simple visual interface where on the left side here, you can see these are the columns of my database. And on the right side here, MuleSoft detects using what they call data sense from the component right next to it that I want to upload an, an account object. So it'll pre-populate the account object with all the field names and, and uh, data types. So I don't have to go into Salesforce and look them up. And then it's just to create the mapping. It's literally just drag and drop from the left to the right. And then that will create my mapping, which is defined here. And this is written in a language called DataWeave. This is proprietary MuleSoft language that is strictly designed for data transformations. So you can see here, it's a key value pair. This is the Salesforce key, and this is my database column name. We have a little bit of a data mismatch here. So in my e-commerce database, I have two separate columns to, to, to note the street name and street number. But in Salesforce account object, they use shipping street and that collects both of them. So what we do here is just do a simple concatenation using a couple plus signs and then that data mismatch is handled. So after we create the account, we move on to the order step, and again, we have a transform message component. We're dragging and dropping, this time, our database's order date field into the Salesforce order effective date field. And here you'll see that we have a little bit of extra code here, and that is to handle different date formats. So in my e-commerce database, you can see order date is date and time. 
However, the effective date in Salesforce, all they want is date with no time. So what I've done here is just, is just half a line of code to fix that data formatting issue. If this was written in Java code, it would be a bunch of lines using some matcher patterns and date formatting classes, as well as a couple lookups to figure out what, uh, what the formatting codes are. And the last step we hear to create the order items, same type of thing. We're taking the product ID and amount columns of our database and mapping it to our order item Salesforce object. Again, here we have a little bit of a data mismatch and this is typical. So the, the IDs, the SKU IDs in our e-commerce site do not match up to the crazy 18 character strings that Salesforce does for their product IDs. So what we do have here is because we just have two products in our database, we just have a simple if else statement that maps the one SKU from our e-commerce site to the Salesforce SKU ID. If you had a more complicated situ situation, you could easily just put the SKU mapping into a database and then query it. And lastly, once we get out of our batch job, we just print a log message that says batch complete. So let me just put a breakpoint in here and we're going to fire up our server in debug mode and then walk through the process together. If you've been around integration engineering for a while, this will actually quite surprise you. I am running the full-fledged ESB from an embedded instance inside AnyPoint Studio. And it's actually quite powerful. I've run batch jobs with hundreds of thousands of records and my computer is held up just fine. So this should trigger every our job every second with the every 60 minutes, but the first one happens as soon as we start off our server. So as soon as this runs, we'll see it the server being stopped on our first breakpoint, which is on our database component. There, so we've stopped now on our database component. We're going to step across it. And now we should have all we do. So we have an all of our database orders have been loaded, so we have one entry for every order in our database. And now we're going to pass this to our batch job. And we take the first record and we transform it and then send a request to Salesforce to create the account. And as you can see, I'm back to the start of this account step. And that is because, again, as I was saying, in batch jobs, we handle records in parallel. So instead of taking one database order across all steps and then taking the next one, we process them in parallel. So we do them all, the account step first, and then we go to the, all, to the create order step. So again, so we'll step in through four orders before we move on to the create order item. And as I was saying before, earlier, if, if I was to cancel this batch job right now, we would have orders with accounts in Salesforce that have no order items. So our data would be in an inconsistent state and someone would have to manually go in there and fix, fix our data issues. So let me step through this. There's my logger. And at the end, I get a nice little summary statement that says four orders processed and four records were successful and zero failed. So that's great. So let's go into Salesforce and make sure this isn't all an illusion. Orders, constantly switching to all. Great, I have my four orders there. You can see my account name is populated, so my account was created successfully. And now I go into the order and you can see that I have my products that have been attached to it. So that's great. So now I'm going to show an example of a real-time MuleSoft flow. So this use case is going to be a little bit different. We're going to pretend that we have an online educational system that provides MuleSoft training. 
One of the products we provide is a free ebook for customers who sign up. So all they have to do is on this form is fill out their first name, last name, email, and phone number and hit the download button and the ebook will get emailed to them. So what we're going to do is create a mule flow that will capture this information and create a lead in Salesforce. And it, kind of a neat thing is this web page itself is being served by Mule itself. So when you're browsing to a web page, you're really just making HTTP REST requests. So the request for the slash signup page is handled by this HTTP listener. You can see the path is slash signup. And then what I do is I just return an HTML page, this index.html, which is hosted in my project. And I return that back to the customer. So once the customer submits the form, I capture that request with this HTTP listener on the path slash lead. And from there I take, I have a transform message where I convert the form data into sales from, I convert the form data into the Salesforce lead object. And again, my mapping, you can see here, my, for, my fields on the form, first name, last name, email, and phone are mapped to my Salesforce lead object. And here's the data weave mapping on the right. I have a few data mismatches that I'm handling here. So in Salesforce lead, they require a company field to be populated. And because I'm not selling to cut to companies, I've hard coded this value to be none. And the second one I have is a little data cleanup on input. So usually when you give someone a field, a for a free text field for phone number, they, they'll enter it in multiple different formats. Some of them enter with spaces, some use hyphens, some use brackets. So what we want to do is just clean up all these non digit characters and just keep the numbers. So what I've done here, just to show how powerful data weave is, I've extended, I've created a function where I can, where called strip non numbers, which is just defined up here, which just calls a replace method that will re that will keep only digits in the zero to nine digit range. And this is how simple it is to do, to do a really complex data transformation. And I chose this just to demo how easy it is so that if you do have some of the more complicated data transformations needed, it's still only just a few lines of code. So once I have my data in my lead object, I send it to Salesforce to create it. And then based on the reply from Salesforce, I either go into the, I have this choice router. So I either print out this message that says successfully created a lead in Salesforce. Or if I got an error back from Salesforce, I print out to my logs an error message that says failed while trying to create a lead in Salesforce. I could create some fancy error handling, but for now we'll just keep it with a log message. And then I return back to the customer, just the message that says, thank you, please check your email for your download. So let's put a breakpoint here. And let's fill out the form. Please pay no attention to that phone number. And because it's a real time processing, I get my breakpoint triggered right away. So right now my payload is holding all the form data in a format called form URL encoded. That's no big deal. Transform message can handle that. So I transform that into my lead object, upload it to Salesforce, and hopefully I go into the upper route which I do, which is great. And then I return back the message. And then my message is presented back to the customer. If I wanted to get fancy, I could send them to another HTML page, uh, a, potentially a confirm page or a success page. Or what I could do is use the email send component here on the left. And I can go ahead and just directly send them the email with the ebook attached to it. So again, let's go into Salesforce. Just to prove that this isn't a fake. 
switch it to all, and there I have my lead with all my information populated. So nine in the morning, it's nine in the morning. So now this lead can be assigned to a sales representative who could follow up with the customer and ask them how they're enjoying their ebook and potentially offer them some other of your products. So even though this mule flow works, it's not what I would call production quality. I wouldn't, I wouldn't release it into a live environment. So what I personally do is what we call an integration engineer, it's hardening. So I'd make it more production ready. And some of the tasks I would do to make that happen is adding this retry logic. Whenever you're making requests across the internet, you could come across what is called a transient error, which just means a temporary error. So if the Salesforce API goes down for a few seconds, which just happened to be while you, you're making the request, or actually requests do get lost every once in a while across the internet. So to handle this, I could wrap my component around this until successfully scope. And what that does is that it'll, in case of an error, it will retry the request after waiting a few seconds, just to make sure that it's not a transient error. If it is a real error, I can now create error handling logic. And inside the error handling, I'm allowed to use any component I could from my normal MuleSoft flows, so I can do some pretty cool things. I can send an email to someone telling them about the error. I could use another connector and create a ticket inside a Jira or Salesforce. Or if I kind of know that certain da data entries create certain errors, I can modify the payload itself and resend it and hopefully it solves that issue. And the last is for batch uploads. So in our batch case, we were creating three calls to Salesforce for every, for every order. If we were loading 100,000 records, this would be 300,000 calls to Salesforce. This would be a very time consuming batch job. So what I can do is wrap my batch component Salesforce connector inside this batch aggregator. And what this will do is it will collect requests to Salesforce and then send them all at once. So this eliminates the amount of times I need to go back and forth to Salesforce and considerably cut down the total time my batch job takes to run. If you're interested in learning more, I have a few URLs that you can visit here that has uh, some great MuleSoft trainings as well as a link to our user community where we host regular developer meetups in major cities all around the world. And some last plugs, I have a YouTube channel where I upload technical MuleSoft tutorials where I step, step through the process of creating flows uh, while sharing my screen. If you're interested, just search my name on YouTube and you'll see my channel. And lastly, if you're looking for a new opportunity or a potential career change, Intuit is always searching for amazing people. Please visit our job board at careers.intuit.com. Thanks for attending and see you next time. Peace. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Just to explain what that was. Last year I was asked by MuleSoft if I wanted to give a talk at the Salesforce conference called Dreamforce. This is Salesforce's annual conference and it's actually the largest developer conference in the world. It's in San Francisco and over 100,000 people attend. It's pretty crazy. So they asked me to submit a speech idea and then if it, if it got approved, which it did, I had to actually write it and then they wanted to see it before I gave it just to make sure that I was doing it correctly and they didn't want to ax me at the last minute. This is a practice run that I gave in front of a representative from Salesforce as well as from MuleSoft. I have a link to the official recording of this presentation in Salesforce in a link in the description. Also, I didn't know this, but if you're at Dreamforce and you attend a presentation, you get a little survey at the end to rate the presentation that you just saw. So I also in the description have a link to my results from those people. It's pretty neat to see it. And finally, for all you viewers that stayed to the end, I really appreciate it. And to show my appreciation, I'm doing a quick contest. This will be a lot simpler than the last one. So all I want you to do is in the comment section below, I want you to li list the three Salesforce objects 
that I do to place an order in this video. The first one to get it, I'll PayPal 30 US bucks to you. And to let you know that you've won, I'll just place a heart next to your comment. And if you see this, please email me. Uh, emails in the description of my YouTube channel with your details and I'll transfer it to you right away. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Peace.